So I'm going to be preaching today on Acts 15, and the sermon will be titled, Breaking Down Barriers. Okay, Breaking Down Barriers. Now, I'm going to add just a short disclaimer here. Um, prior to researching this, I didn't realize this passage was so highly debated. It's one of those things I read it, thought it was pretty straightforward. Uh, then I started doing some research on it, and I realized people were really getting heated about this. So, so the big thing that we'll encounter in this passage is uh, like half of Christians are saying that Acts 15 is saying we don't have to follow the Ten Commandments and the laws of Moses, right? Um, and then the other half, like mostly Jewish Christians, are saying, no, this is just a, a, an intro course, basically. This is, you know, what you have to do when you first become a Christian, then you, you convert to Judaism and Christianity, right? So it's kind of a, a split. Didn't realize that going into it. Um, so I wanted to give you guys a disclaimer. Personally, I think when we're looking at that, we're kind of missing the whole point of the passage. Um, but we'll talk about that a little later. I don't want to give away the ending just yet. Um, so I want to start with... Sometimes, I don't want to be offensive, sometimes Christians are weird, right? I mean, can I be honest? I mean, it's cool. Like, I'm, I'm a part of it now. Like, I, I've joined the tribe, subscribed to the newsletter. Like, uh, I'm a Christian now. Um, but we sometimes do and say some weird things, right? So I was watching a video earlier this week, and what they did is they asked uh, non-Christians what common Christian phrases meant. Um, so non-Christians are being given common Christian phrases that most of us in the room will probably understand. Um, they didn't. And I'm not going to play the video because it was, it was not clean. Uh, again, non-Christians. Uh, just want to throw that out there. But some of the phrases they were asked is, what is a love offering? As you can imagine, that was misunderstood. They were asked, what does, um, what does seeing the fruit mean? Again, misunderstood. Um, finally, they were asked, you know, what does washed in the blood mean? Again, misunderstood. I mean, to us, this is all very, very clear, right? We, we know what most of these mean. Oh, there's one called the 1040 window. I had no idea what that meant. I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian anymore. Um, but apparently that is the area of the globe, like the latitude and longitude where the most unreached people are. So pretty cool. But that's what 1040 window means, in case you're wondering. Um, but imagine for a moment, because we understand this, it's hard for us to see these phrases as weird. But imagine someone of a different religion, right, comes walking down and they're like, we're going to go bathe in blood. I mean, that's strange. We're not going to hang out with those dudes at Arby's, right? Like, we're not going to be part of that. So, I mean, sometimes, like, the things we say... Are, are misinterpreted by people who don't understand Christian lingo. And, and I was actually the victim of this uh, before I became a Christian. Whenever I was like 15 years old, I was staying the night with a friend, and uh, his parents had decided we were going to go to church the next morning. I was not let in on this information um, until the next morning when I woke up at like 6 a.m., and they were telling me to get ready for church. Um, so they're like, let's go to church. I'm like, uh, I'm not feeling so good. And they, they made me go anyway. Um, and so we got to this church, it was a little bitty church, um, and, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, cause I can be transparent here, I think. Um, I was 15, I didn't want to be there, I wasn't exactly connecting with anything the pastor was saying, um, until the end, when he said something along the lines, if I remember correctly, of, we were going to eat flesh and drink blood. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and I'm trying to get my friend's attention right, but you're in a quiet service. I'm like, dude, what is going on? He's like, shut up. And I'm like, bro, what have you got me into? Right? <laughs> this just got weird. I mean, he got my attention, but not in a good way. And, and, and then I was r r halfway relieved, right? Halfway relieved when they bring out like oyster crackers and Kool-Aid. Um, except then my initial thought goes to, am I joining a cult? Like, is this how I go out? Am I about to drink the Kool-Aid, just mass suicide here? Is this what's happening to me right now? Right, because I had no idea what was going on. I clearly, now I know it was communion, but I, I clearly had no right to be there doing this at this moment. But I was the victim of Christian lingo because I didn't know what was happening, what was going on. For some reason, I still drank the Kool-Aid. Um, I would apparently have been very easy to kill at 15. Uh, because I'm like, I'm going to die. I guess let's do it, right? 
I, I still don't know why I did it, but I did it. But that can oftentimes be a, a barrier, right? And it, it's simply this. It's, it's not that we as Christians are doing anything wrong because when we're talking to other Christians and stuff, it's clear what we mean. We can say things like, you know, washed in the blood and sanctification and salvation and, and use all these big Christian words that, you know, make us feel good. But when we're talking to someone who's not a Christian, it can make it very uncomfortable, right? And, and if there's someone, you know, in the service and you don't exactly explain what's going on, they're not going to get it. I mean, it, it would be the same. I remember Pastor Dennis telling me that when he was in college, he had to go, uh, one of his courses, they required him to go to a, a church service of a different religion. And he went to synagogue. And he was so confused, like he had no idea what was going on, right? It would be the same for us if we went to a, a mosque or if we went to mass or if we went to a synagogue. You know, if we went to one of these other services, we would have no idea what was going on, right? The, the environment, the lingo, the, the phrasing, the songs, like it would be super, super weird. And we would initially have all these barriers up, right? Because we're walking in like we're weird. This, or this is weird. I'm not weird. This is weird. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, what we're going to do, what they're going to expect me to do, you know, and then you always have that, that nerves of like, is the person going to call you on stage for some reason? Because they always seem to do that when you're most uncomfortable, right? So sometimes church service can be weird for someone who's not familiar with it, right? And, and I think that the easiest way to put this is that our mission as Christians, as a church, as a gathering of believers, our goal is to tear down barriers, right? Our mission is to find the barriers that people are putting up because people put up every single day, they put up barriers, right? Pastor Dennis once told me about, I said I wasn't gonna tell this story because I was afraid my youth would be in here. Pastor Dennis used to tell me about a youth pastor uh, that he knew that they would go in and they would have like an hour and a half of games and then they would have like, Five, a five-minute message, and then they would end. And, and Dennis asked him, like, why do you do that? And he said, because these kids come in here with so many guards up. They come in here with so many barriers up that they have school, and they have bullies, and they have home life, and they have barriers, and they have relationships, and they have all these guards that they've put up in front of themselves. And he spends the majority of the time trying to knock down those barriers so that the message of Jesus can get into their hearts. And that's the same thing. It's true for each and every one of us and all our friends and family and unbelievers. It's that, guys, outside of these walls, life still happens, right? When we walk out those doors, when we walk into Monday, life is going to happen again. And we're going to be stressed from work. We're going to be stressed with family. We're going to have health issues. We're going to have family issues. We're going to have all sorts of barriers that get put up that block us from getting to Jesus, right? That's just going to happen, and it happens to each and every person. So our goal is to start breaking down the barriers as soon as people start pulling in the parking lot. Right, so if we, we imagine it sort of like this, we're not having baptisms today, by the way, this is just the best barrier illustration I could find. Imagine you have people on this side of the barrier that are absolutely starving. They need food more than they need anything else in the world. But there is a barrier in their way there is something blocking them from getting to the nourishment that they need, would we not do everything in our power to tear down this barrier? I believe that we would. I believe that's why missions are so effective and so popular is because we see real physically starving people and we want to tear down every barrier we can to make a difference in their life that we want to bust through the strongholds that are keeping them, right? We want to, to feed them. We want to get them to the nourishment that they need. Right, but I want to say that there are people on this block, in this city, that are starving and they need spiritual nourishment. In the same way that there's something stopping people from getting physical food, there are barriers that are stopping people from getting spiritual food. There are barriers that people have put up that are keeping them from getting to Jesus. And our goal as Christians are to get people to Jesus, right? Once we've accepted Jesus, Rick Warren says in his book, Purpose Driven Life, once we've accepted Jesus, it's not about you. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's not about me. It's about getting other people to Jesus. That's my goal. That's my mission. That's my job. Jesus said it himself, make disciples of all nations. That is now our mission, is that we find other starving people and we lead them to where we found food. That is our goal. So what we're going to find... 
what we're going to find when we read Acts is the first barrier, or one of the big barriers that pulls itself up to the Gentile believers with the early church. So we're going to ask the question, how do we break down barriers? So let's read in Acts 15.1 about how they break down barriers. Acts 15.1, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles, too, were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So you can see how we're already getting started with this question. Do Christians have to follow the Ten Commandments? Do Christians have to follow the law of Moses? So the first thing this, the early church does is they identify the barriers. It's the first thing that they do. They find the barriers. And I think the very barrier here is pretty simple. Circumcision. That's going to keep a lot of grown men away. I'm just being real, dude. I mean, could you imagine that conversation if we still practice that one today? You know, stopping Joe out in the parking lot. Joe, it came to my attention, man. That you're not circumcised? This cool. We got Bobby Joe in the back sharpening the shears. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm just dropping off the wife and kids. I got a game to watch, right? Like, <laughs> that's a barrier. <laughs> right? So the first barrier is keeping these Gentile believers from Jesus is circumcision. But, but honestly, it goes even a little further than that. I know that's the, that's the funny part, unless you're a Gentile believer trying to be Christian. It's not funny at all then. But, but the worst part is, is what they're saying is to be saved, you need Jesus plus Moses, right? That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing equals everything, right? Anytime we add something to Jesus for salvation, we no longer have grace, we have a transaction, right? Because because if it is a free gift, grace is a free gift from God. If we could do anything to earn it, it's no longer a gift, it's a transaction. It's like, here, I'll gift you this car for $5,000. It's not how it works, right? A gift is freely given. So anytime we add anything to Jesus, we've now perverted the gospel. Because the gospel is Jesus paid it all to give you the free gift of salvation, so these early Pharisee believers, that's right, Pharisee believers, they're Pharisees who became believers, are trying to add to the gospel. They're trying to tell these people that you need Jesus plus Moses plus the law plus good works, and then you can be saved. That is perversion of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus already paid it all for you. There's no, nothing anymore that you can do. He's did it all. You just have to accept his free gift. That is the gospel. So the first problem we're having is, is that they're, they're putting up these barriers, these false teachings that are blocking people from getting to Jesus. So the first thing the disciples do is they, they identify the barriers. So the first thing we have to do when we're thinking about reaching lost people, when we're thinking about reaching you know, people that don't believe in Jesus, the first thing we have to do is identify the barriers that are keeping people from Jesus. And guys, these are very real and they're not dumb, they make sense. They're some of the very things that kept me from Jesus for so long. So we have to look at them and address them. And in all the research I've done, it always comes down to about the same four things, regardless of how they word it. It always comes down to, because we are in a post-Christian culture, that most people will have been to church at some point in their life. Most people will have attended a church, which is part of the problem is most people have attended a church, right? And a lot of times in that church, People have been hurt, or people have seen reasons to have distrust. People have seen the gospel of Jesus taught but not lived, 
right? They, they, they've seen the church fail. And I'm not saying we're going to be perfect by any means, but I'm just saying this is what they say has led them away from the church, is failure in the church. Another reason, one of the really popular reasons, is that they grew up in a religious household, but it wasn't necessarily lived out, right? That they saw acting on Sunday mornings and true selves come out on Mondays. That's a, that's a sad fact. I'm, I'm quoting what I've read here. That's a sad fact, but it happens. And, and most of the time, the kids are, will say, why do I need to waste my Sundays if I'm not going to live it out the rest of the week? It must not matter enough to actually live out in my life because we only do it one day a week. Third most popular reason, probably what a lot of us expect, is that they went off to college or they've had someone else of a different belief convince them otherwise, right? As a lot of you know, I'm, I'm super passionate about apologetics. I like the ability to, de to vent, defend my faith against someone who disagrees with me. But the problem is that is I don't know that we are taught it enough. Like most Christians, I know myself, like for a long time, I couldn't defend the beliefs that I had. Like if someone came up to me, and, and I mean, when you think of this against religions like Islam, where they have to study and memorize parts of, of, of the Quran, when you compare this with, you know, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, when they are required to take evangelism courses before they can go and tell people about their beliefs, right? that most of us are not equipped to defend our faith. And, and that's a huge problem because our kids run off to college and they're immediately gonna be met by someone who disagrees with their belief. And if they don't have a way to defend that belief, what leg are they standing on? So that's another reason. They've simply been talked out of it. They have no reason to believe. And, and the last one that always seems to come up is that they think Christianity is odd or ineffective which is heartbreaking to think that Christianity is ineffective. I don't believe that because I believe that we have the greatest message in the world and that if we would mobilize together, not just Grace Community Church, but every church in Cumberland County and the state of Tennessee, if we could mobilize together that we could change the world because we have the greatest mission and the greatest message in the world. Christianity is not ineffective, but sometimes our ways of accomplishing our mission is. So those are the four most common barriers that I see brought up. But I think it's interesting, I think it's extremely interesting that on no list have I ever seen that someone said they didn't like Jesus. I've never heard anyone, even an unbeliever, say they didn't like Jesus, if they truly knew him. Right, most people don't dislike our Christ, they dislike our Christians. Actually, Gandhi himself, which is a pretty stand-up guy, said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That one hurts. But the good news is, this isn't a, something on, on the news. It's not something that we can't fix. It's not something going on in Syria that we can't do anything about. This is something we can correct today. These barriers that are standing in the way of people getting to Jesus, we are fully in control of how they get torn down. Because we, in this church, in this community, are a body of believers. We have the option, we have the opportunity to reach people for Jesus. Right? People think that it being a post-Christian culture is a bad thing. No, that means there's more opportunity than ever. That means there are more people that need our message than ever before. So how can we take this message to people? Jesus gave us very clear instructions in Mark 12. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. If we love our neighbors as ourself. After all, that's our mission, is to get starving people to food. That's our whole mission. And I think we do this by simple everyday acts. 
I don't think we, we go, you know, jump up on the self-checkout at Walmart and preach a message to the heathens. I don't think that's going to do it. I think we simply go and we love people. We be kind. We be generous. We be caring. We love. We give kind words. We, we are loving to those people that are the hardest to love. When someone's trying to fight with us, we show them love back, right? We go out and we actually be like Jesus to a world that needs Jesus more than they need anything else. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That is our calling, to reach the world. And to do that, all we've got to do is live like Jesus instructed us, to love God and to love our neighbors, that's how we do it. And when we can do that, we begin de deconstructing these barriers that people have put up, right? All these thoughts they had about Christianity that they were once heard in the church, we can make them reconsider that. That they grew up in a religious household, when they see someone else actually living it out, they may say, oh, there might be something to this faith. When they were convinced that there was no good in Christianity by someone who didn't believe, when they see your actions, your kind words, your generosity, they may say, well, that person knows something I must not know. And when they think that Christianity is odd or ineffective, when they see us using it effectively in everyday life and just simply loving and showing the grace of God, they may start to ask questions about why is this person so happy? Why is this person so generous? Why is this person so loving? And whenever they're hurting, they may come to you because they know how generous, loving, and kind you are. You see, those barriers that people construct, we can simply be kind and start deconstructing them. That's how we begin tearing down barriers. You get back up here. So let's continue reading, starting in verse 6. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve the issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors could bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. I think that's power, that Peter stands up and he addresses these Pharisee believers and he says, why are you putting a yoke on their neck that we nor our ancestors could live up to? Why do we look at other people and expect them to be perfect when we're not able to? Why do we look at other people and expect more out of them than we can give ourselves? Peter goes even further, though, and he says, even if they were perfect, even if they were, even if our enemies were perfect and lived up to every single law and they did everything as perfect as they could be, it does not matter because we are not saved by the law. We are saved by the undeserved grace of Jesus. That is how we are saved. It's nothing that we could do, that we could earn, that any work we could put forward, we were saved by the undeserved grace of Jesus. Then verse 12 goes on to say, the whole assembly became quiet as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Now, I just think this is funny because have you ever been at a point in an argument and you know you've lost and you're just sitting there quiet, just listening intently for your yeah, but statement? You know, you're just, yes, dear, yes, dear, yes, dear, right? You're, you're, you have nothing else to say. I feel like they're, they're sort of at this point when Peter's just dropping knowledge bombs right now that they, that they don't know what else to do or what else to say or how to counter what he's saying and they have silence. But then... Something real cool is about to happen. James, the actual brother of Jesus, is about to get up and he's just, he's about to drop the mic is what's going to happen. 
Because in the past 20 years since uh, the Passover where the Holy Spirit came down on everyone, James has established himself as like the leader of the Christians in Jerusalem. And so James is about to get up and he's going to address what everyone has said and he's just going to kind of close the chapter on what happened here. So we'll go and read that starting in 13. We'll read it on to the end. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take, them, to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted as it is written. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He he who made these things known so long ago. James goes on to say, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. That part's very important. We'll come back to it. Then the apostles and elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates and then sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men, cho- the men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come Come to a complete agreement to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning the question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. Okay, that's our reading for today. I think something very powerful happens here. James gets up and first he says, let's not make it difficult for the Gentiles to come to Jesus. Let's not make it difficult for the Gentiles to come to Jesus. And there's a part where he says, Where is it? He says that this is practiced. I've lost it now. Sorry about that. But he says this has been practiced. This teaching of Moses has been practiced in in every nation. You see, the instruction that he gives to these Gentiles, which is, you know, not eat meat offered to idols, not eat meat with blood or that's been strangled or sexual immorality. We think of this as a commandment, but it's more of a call to community. He's saying that, This has been taught in all these other places, so you should probably live up to it so that when people see you, they know that you're actually of Christ, right? It's going to be hard for Jewish believers and Gentile believers to come together for meals, which is very important in this culture, to come together for meals for community if you're eating meat offered to idols or with blood or doing that other things. Like They're not going to be able to accept you into their community, so a lot of scholars believe this is a community issue. Now, I believe as believers, obviously, when we read Scripture, there are things we must abstain from doing, and and these are things that we should abstain from. But at this moment, James is mainly saying, hey, let's keep the peace. Let's come together as a community, as a church of people, as a community of believers, and let's get along with each other, right? But one thing I really want to focus on is James says, let's not make it hard for the Gentile believers to come to Jesus, which I think we're clearly doing, 
by forcing the law of Moses onto them. If we're, we're clearly doing it by requiring circumcision, right? We're making it difficult on them. And that's something I think that if we reflect on today, we've got to ask ourselves, are we making it hard for unbelievers to come to Jesus? If not, what could we be doing to make it easier? And I think simply as we said before, if we would love our neighbors, as ourselves, if we would love those around us, we would show the love, passion, and grace of Jesus that we would make it easier. Because I don't know that if you've seen Christianity talked about in non-Christian circles, they don't think very highly of us. But if we could give them undeniable truths, if we could show the world that Christians truly live like Jesus, that if we could do our absolute best, where none of us are perfect, we're all gonna snap at some point, right? But if we could do our absolute best to simply love those around us, to show the grace that this world is not showing anyone, if we could be standing out because of our love, I feel like we could make it easier for people to come to Jesus. That's something that we, we strive to do even here at Grace in sort of practical senses. Here at Grace, we want our main goal is to make it easy for other people to come to know Jesus. That's our goal. I mean, from the, from the moment you walk in the doors, to be honest, the sermon starts in the parking lot, right? From the moment uh, someone shows up here that may not know Jesus, or may be far from Jesus, may have not been church in years, or may have never been to church, from the moment they come, we are intentional about helping to tear down barriers and kill misconceptions of what Christianity and church is. Because ultimately the whole goal is to get people from here to here and to get them to know Jesus, get them in a relationship with Jesus and to see lives changed. From the moment you walk in the door and you're greeted by a smiling face, a new person has the option. They can then cut left and they can come into a, a dark auditorium if they don't want to be confronted or, or talk to anyone because that's okay. Because if, if we went to, a, again, a mosque or a synagogue, we probably wouldn't want to be confronted by anybody. We just want to sit in the back and watch what's happening. But if they choose, they can go that way and there's bold signage to show you where to check in your kids, where to get coffee, where to get snacks. There's tables to talk and to hang out and to, to fellowship with other people. Then you come in here and we're intentional about the music that we sing, that we want the music to always point to Jesus, but we want the music to be relaxing, to be comfortable, to get you pumped up and fired up for a message that's gonna be taught to people who may not understand church language. Right, we always try to break down the message to where it's unbeliever friendly. Because I showed up at this church as an unbeliever and for the first time in my life, I understood everything a preacher said. That's power. And that's what Jesus did. Believe it or not, Jesus did not come out and, and scream at the people, right? He came, he came out and, and, and clearly I'm a passionate person so I shouldn't talk too much on that. But, <laughs> but Jesus actually came and he sat down and he told stories. Right? Stories are understandable. Stories are relatable. Stories draw you in and put you in the picture. That's the purpose of a story. Jesus told stories. We fancify it and call it parables, right? Jesus told stories. That's how Jesus taught, and that's how we strive to teach up here in a way that with zero knowledge of the Bible, you'll understand what is going on. And we, we intentionally dress down so that it feels more relaxed and because I only own one suit. But that's beside the point. But we intentionally break down barriers that are stopping people from getting to Jesus. That's our whole goal, because our, our sermon starts in the parking lot. People have already decided if those barriers are coming down before they ever hear the pastor on stage, right? So we're intentional that we want to break down barriers so people can come to know Jesus, because that's the most important thing. You and I, Christians in this room, we already know Jesus. In that, in that case, we already know how important it is that other people come to know Jesus too. Because he is the only way to eternal life. Right? Now to further illustrate this, I want to I get a couple of volunteers up here. Michael, Tasha, you guys mind to come up? I've seen you point at him. <laughs> Trying to pass it off. All right. Andrew, you want to come on up? See you over there hiding. All right, all right. Um, Andrew, you get this pillar. Michael, you get that one. Tasha, you just hold this one. Okay, so let's illustrate. This one, right? You can get in front of it. Yeah, okay. So there. What? 
Did it break? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, my wife was telling me what to do. All right. <laughs> Good job, I listened. <laughs> Thank you for that. Good job, Jeff. Okay, so there are starving people, we're talking spiritually starving people, that are being blocked by barriers that are stopping them from getting to the nourishment they desperately need. Right, and, and we can't ever know exactly what these barriers are. They could be past bad experiences with church, like we've talked about. It could be busyness. It could simply be life, right? Because we go out those doors and life happens to us and we get stressed out, but these barriers are there. And you see, the thing is, is Christianity, there was only one hero and that was Jesus, right? The, the, the person up here speaking on the stage is not the hero. The, the, the person greeting people, serving coffee, the evangelist on TV is not the hero, Right, because not one of us can save anyone, right? All we can do is piece by piece help break down barriers and misconceptions that people have. So simply what we can do is one act of kindness, one act of love can, can remove a piece of the barrier. You can go and pull that pillar off. It'll come right off there. That one act of kindness, one act of love can make someone question, maybe I was wrong about Christianity. Maybe that person knows something I don't know. And then maybe they're, they meet someone else. Go ahead. And, and, and another piece of the barrier comes off. And piece by piece, the barrier, the barrier is coming apart. And you guys can go and lay this all the way down to the ground. Until finally, one day, they ask the question that matters more than anything. You guys are good. You can go on down. I just couldn't take it down by myself. But that's the whole point. Christianity is not a one-man show, except for Jesus. But us, our mission is not a one-man show. It's a team effort. That not one of us can deconstruct this whole barrier. But when we work together, we can put down the barrier that we can love people. We can show people the true love and grace of Jesus so that the starving person who doesn't know Jesus, his barrier can be knocked down and he can step through it and to ask the ultimate question, what must I do to be saved? And that answer is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right, but we work together as a team to break down the barriers that are stopping people from getting to Jesus. And we do that very simply by live, living out the instructions Jesus gave us to go out and make disciples of all nations, to love God, and to love our neighbor. If we could show the love, right, imagine just a moment. There are like 300 churches in Crossville. There's barely 300 people, but we have 300 churches. Okay. If every one of those churches, if the people inside of every one of these churches could walk out of there and truly live out the gospel, to truly follow the words of Jesus, to simply show the world, the world the love that Jesus has, if we could show the love, the grace, the acceptance, the power of Jesus, we could change this community in a single day. Because people can say no to, to judgmental Christians. They can't say no to the love of Jesus. They can't say no to the love of Jesus. If we could simply show that love to the world and each and every one of us can go out there today and make that happen. We can show the love that Jesus has for us. And we do that by simple everyday acts that we remove barriers piece by piece. And we do it as a team that it's not gonna do for just one of us to go out there. Each and every one of us has to go out and show the love of Jesus. We tear down barriers as a team. It's called the church. And not just Grace Community Church. I love my church. This is where I belong, this is where I was saved. I love where I'm at. But this is a calling not just for Grace Community Church. This is a calling for every church in Cumberland County, in the state of Tennessee, in the world, that we have to go out and crush misconceptions that people have about Jesus. Because people never come to know our Christ because they know our Christians. Right, because so many people think Jesus is who Christians are. But if we could actually show people who Jesus is through our actions, we could change this world that we're living in. D.T. Niles says it this way. Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. That's all Christianity is. 
We're not special. We've just found the bread that everyone else, is, everyone else needs. I'm going to end it with this statement. Our job is to, I'm sorry, I'm going to end it with this story. Our job is to tear down barriers. But I want to say that Jesus has already went ahead of us and tore down the barriers needed to get us to Christ. So we used to stay, we used to stay with my grandma a lot. And where my grandma lived, right up the road, is up this big hill and around the corner, there was this gas station. And we used to go to that gas station for everything. We lived off pinto beans from that gas station, right? And, and instead of going up the road and around the corner, uh, my dad was sort of an outdoorsy person, so uh, we would cut through the woods. And, and we would always cut down through these woods, and we'd walk up, and, and the, the trail would bring you up right at the gas station. And we would come out, we'd go to the gas station, and we'd come right back, probably, you know, 20-minute round trip. And I didn't realize this until I was actually preparing this message, but I remember almost every time we would get back, my dad would have thorns in his hands, He'd be bleeding on his arms. His clothes would be torn. It was apparently a treacherous trail. I had no idea. I had no idea. Because he went in front of me. And he cleared out every bush that was in my way. He cleared out every thorn that was, had its eye on me. That he went before me and he took the scars. And he took the pain and he moved them out of my way. So that I could walk down a path free of any limitations. That's what Jesus has done for us. That's what Jesus has done for us. That he came and he saw the path and he cleared it for us. He knew that he would be scarred. He knew that he would have thorns in his head. He'd have a hole in his side and holes in his hands. He knew what was to come. But he loved you so very much. He cleared that path. He broke down those barriers and he kicked your way into heaven, into salvation, into eternal life. He cleared the path to the Father because only He could do it. We needed a perfect person to go on our behalf and do it, and that was only God. You see, I want to end with this. If you're here and none of this other message mattered because you may not know Jesus yet, you're not a Christian, you're not leading anybody anywhere. I just want you to know, no matter what your misconceptions are, no matter what you think about Christianity or what Christianity you faced in the past or what some college professor has told you or what you've seen, in the lives of those who call themselves followers of him. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. If we leave with nothing else today, absolutely nothing else, know that he loves you more than you could ever know. That he has a love for you that is so powerful, it is beyond human understanding, that he went before us to clear the path, he gave his life on our behalf because he loves us so much. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do, because Jesus loves us. We serve a God unlike any other. We serve a God who loves us beyond our ability to be loved. And that's who we serve. And that's why I love that song they sing, Reckless Love. Because if we look at Jesus' journey to the cross, his love very much was reckless. His love put him in a path of destruction, but he did it freely. He gave his life openly for you and me. He loves us that much. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, that's okay. He's broke down every barrier that stood in your way. All you have to do is call on his name and accept him as Lord and Savior. That is all you must do. If you're here and you are saved, your story's not over. Your journey's not ended. You have a new story. You have a new beginning. You're now, your goal is all these people down the path that Jesus has cleared for them. Your goal is to get other people down the road that Jesus has cleared. Your goal is to get people to Jesus and know that he will never leave you nor will he forsake you and he'll be with you in every area and every path and every struggle and every temptation. The Lord our God will not leave us nor forsake us. He is with us everywhere that we go. That is the promise we have in Jesus. I pray as you go out and you face that life that's going to throw up barriers this week that you will know no matter what, he is with you and he loves you and he'll always be there for you. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for this day, for everything you do for us, that you do through us. God, I just pray that you'll be with each and every person in here. God, that you would give us the strength and the courage to reach people in your name 
that we would go out and we would break down barriers, God, to get people to you. Because the most important thing we can do is to lead other people to you. Because that's more important than anything in this world. That's more important than anything else is that people come to know you. It's the difference in eternity. God, I pray that you would give us the strength and courage to pursue you wholeheartedly, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.